Welcome back, Ms. Greenberg. Thank you, Chief. You um, may proceed. I'm, I'm Ruth Greenberg on behalf of Mr. Young Mr. Coro. Uh, I'll ask the court to help me organize my time a little bit. I'd like to devote maybe three minutes to questions which are particular to Mr. Coro and on the basis of which you might be able to resolve this case and then talk generally about the statutory framework for sentencing children. Uh, in, in this case, I'd like you just briefly to revisit uh, Judge Troy's decision not to permit uh, instruction on defense of another in this case. It's, I, I respect the difficulty of being a trial judge. The trial judge didn't have a transcript in the same way that I do to see the basis for an instruction that Mr. Okoro was acting to defend his sister. Uh, if you read through, and I've marked in my brief, those portions of the transcript that show that the instruction was, in this case, indeed justified, and that she certainly had been placed at risk by the difficult position she had put herself in because she was going to be a witness for the Commonwealth in a different murder case. She had been shot at a lot, and the record's really uncontested on that. Uh, I also want to say that when a judge evaluates whether a person is acting in defense of another, when you make a decision where the movie starts, you have to make that decision uh, in a way that's most favorable to the defendant too. So if you were considering this as the Commonwealth urged the judge to do as a premeditated murder, where a defendant started at the beginning, chose a weapon, planned to kill, in, which was evidence that was offered by the Commonwealth, then you might say there was no reason to think he was defending his sister. But if you considered it in the light most favorable to the defense, you would have to consider whether the instruction was warranted really just before the what we'll call the fatal altercation began that when these two children, uh, the defendant with his younger sister behind him, uh, were facing what appeared to this very young and impaired man to be a threat. They were trapped in a crowd. There was evidence of other weapons carried by other people at the scene. And uh, young Mr. Okoro certainly knew that the uh, decedent in this case had attacked his sister before and she was crowded in. So I am not saying, I am saying nothing other than that such a instruction was warranted and that also the failure to give such an instruction if warranted couldn't be harmless. And the reason for that is the difference between the requirement of retreat and no requirement of retreat because even if Mr. Okoro didn't have to be there, there was really, he didn't have to leave if he thought his sister was in danger. And while that, that might be, that's a mitigation of murder to manslaughter as well as a complete defense, uh, even if you're using more force than what might be required, I, you know, and even if your judgment is poor and acting to solve a very complex problem in the city of Brockton where people are killed for cooperating with the police and investigations. And I think we have to recognize that the defendant was entitled to recognize that. Now, I gather Mr. Kuna asked for it. It was denied. Yes. He didn't preserve the objection at the conclusion of the instructions, but while the jury was deliberating, he then objected. Is that correct? Right. And I, I think under Commonwealth versus Biancardi, it's clear the judge said no. I, I mean, they discussed it at length, and the judge said no, and there was he <coughs> objected again in the middle. I mean, he made his point clear. And the judge said no. I, I'm, I'm curious. I don't. I haven't looked at the transcript. Did, did uh, counsel argue in closing argument that in fact that's exactly what Mr. Okoro was doing was trying to defend his sister? It's mixed. I mean, he didn't get the instruction, so the the jury had no basis to acquit on it because the instruction wasn't given. 
I also mention this with regard to preservation, this question which is perhaps of greater importance to more young people facing trial on homicide charges, this question whether youth standing alone may be, uh, may be argued as a, a form of mental impairment given as what we know. Did you really write youth as a disorder? You yes. did, didn't you? So is age, by the way. I've, I've noticed that recently, but. <laughs> Judge, I, I'm going to restrain myself. <laughs> Smart. <laughs> Thank you. First. Uh, well, if, yes. if, it, if it were, would that, for all practical purposes, mean that you could never get a first or second degree involving a juvenile? No. What you could do is present the issue to a jury. I am not making the argument. The, I am not saying that a legislature cannot pass a law saying that 14-year-olds can be tried. I am saying that the, the legislature can't, we can't have a, a scheme where only 14-year-olds, the Commonwealth doesn't have to prove mental state. In every case where the Commonwealth has to prove murder, they have to prove mental state, they have to prove the difference between third prong malice and involuntary manslaughter. And in those cases where we're looking at the difference as here between third prong malice and involuntary manslaughter, the mental state, uh, cognitive abilities, emotional abilities, youth as an impairment is at issue. And I don't think we contest anymore that youth is not a disability and why the, we have no basis in law for treating it any differently than any other impairment. But, but you, had, you had an expert here who did a very fine job, it seems, um, in describing this young man's personal mental state and was not permitted to testify that youth is an impairment per se, but certainly was able to testify about the development and the mental capacity of this person based on his experience, right? Well, I will answer that in two ways. One, when this court speaks, it speaks to the ages. And so if youth indeed, as I argue, is an impairment, you need to say so, so judges will permit the evidence and allow the argument. The question then becomes, in this case, what is the harm? And here we say, one, because you can backdoor in some of the evidence which the court forbid doesn't mean you can present everything you could present if allowed. But the other cases which argue for harm are those cases which go to the power of closing argument. Because here, the judge was explicit and the trial lawyer objected nonstop, but the judge was explicit that the trial lawyer could not argue that being young was itself an impairment. And a jury, I think, might well have said, well, maybe not, you know, maybe we don't like that stuff about he was abused as a kid and therefore he gets a free pass. I don't know if it's proper to make judicial reference to comments in the Herald on the internet, but a lot of people don't like he had a hard time and therefore gets a free pass. Those same people who don't like that argument, and there could be six of them on your jury, might be way more willing to accept an argument that applied to their own children. Can I just says, focus? Yes. I, I, I tried very hard to understand what it is that more that you wanted from this expert who, who testified for many, many pages, including, uh, and I try to compare it to your argument, including really about, all, as far as I can tell, so many aspects of of, of a youth's brain and how it's different, and talked about the differences, talked about myelination and the process uh, that o occurs in youth and, and pruning and, and the differences and what happens um, as, a, as a youth gets older and the differences um, in, in response generally. So, so with all that information, uh, what is it exactly that was not elicited? I, what, what, if you could have asked the question and gotten a response, because he also later says, of course, I can't tell you about his intent, because that's, that's a fact, it's not what I do. 
So what is the question and what is the answer that you feel that you that uh, should have been allowed here? Judge, most respectfully, I'm going to refer you to those pages in my brief where I list the 13 questions we were not allowed to ask. And more importantly, I, I, you, I looked at your brief and I looked at the I sites got. and I've read them and I also considered it keeps escaping me. Um, I, I considered that the judge may have overstated what wasn't permissible, but in fact allowed a lot more in. You, you decide a lot to, and that may be wrong. I, I'm not saying that. I do that agree. Was, Much she, came the judge in. said, yeah. articulated the ruling over broadly, perhaps. Maybe that was error. But now, in terms of what in fact got in. I agree with you, Judge. A lot came in. But if you can't argue it, it is as if, constitutionally speaking, it did not. Because when you are forbidden to make the argument, the evidence is not as helpful. Because the entitlement to the evidence entitles you to marshal argument therefrom. So the marshaling of argument would say, and given all that you've heard, if you could have made that right. argument, given all of the uh, special characteristics that are attendant to youth, uh, which they can grow out of, you should tr be able to treat that you, jury, as a, as a disability, like any other disability, any other mental impairment, when considering whether right. there was intent. You Even though you argued that, that you weren't arguing about intent. Well, of course you are. The question in this case, whether what happened here was involuntary manslaughter or third prong malice, came all the way up to Judge Spina, who actually ruled in a single justice ruling that the defendant would, of course, be allowed to argue, and I think the words in your ruling included youth. He would be allowed to, because of his youth, he would be allowed to present uh, a defense of, the lesser included defense of involuntary manslaughter, because the difference between the state of mind required for third prong malice, and we do have a second degree conviction here, and the state of mind which is required, which is recklessness, really. I mean, it's a very can we small turn difference. to the can we turn to the sentence? Yes, thank you I very just, much, I, Judge. I, I, just, I don't mean to. I'm worried yes. about your time. Um, thank you, Judge. And if the court allows me extra, I can take it off my case on Friday. <laughs> <laughs> I will give you some extra time to address it, but I will not take it against your other client on Friday. Thank but, you very much, But it is an important judge. issue, so we do want to be adequately Thank discussed. you very much, Judge. And Chief, now I'm looking right at you because I think this case is controlled by your decision in Commonwealth versus Cole. And I, I do not go as far as the friends of the court who argued that there can be no mandatory sentence applied to a child. I leave that argument to another day. My argument here today is that you cannot have a sentence of life which is effectively transferred from the legislature directly to the parole board without violating Article 30. And okay. I think when you say no mandatory sentence, um, are, are, are you, what about a sentence of 20 years to life? It's the, li it's the ending in life which- but, but you could have a minimum mandatory. You could, in this case, I don't argue otherwise. It is in this case that I argue you can't have a 15 to life. Can I ask you this question? I'm, I'm sorry. Go ahead. You, well, assume that's correct. C Thank can't you. have that. Um, so you say the judge, uh, the trial judge, needs to have a kind of Miller hearing, yes? Yes. But. W is there any role for a later parole or somebody making a decision at some later point in time? Or how, how does, in other words, if you had the judge, what is the judge doing saying, saying, looking at the facts of this case today and it's two years after the event, event but this child is now 16 and was 14 at the time. I'm gonna give a life sentence, that's okay? Well, and let, there's no parole let, no. eligibility? Or what? No, life without parole has been without parole as a as a. Okay, all right. So so, so then the, the judge table. sets the time in which parole eligibility becomes uh, a factor. Let me let me give you the complete answer and go backwards from there to the question. What I am saying is the judiciary needs to be empowered. 
And what I am also saying is that, in fact, we have a statutory framework that, while now it violates Article 26 and Article 30, can be stretched in some regard. We can interpolate meaning into it to allow it to empower the judiciary to satisfy Articles 26 and 30. And what I would propose as a constitutionally adequate solution to this complex network of parole statute, parole regulation, legislation, and the power of the courts is to say that a judge is permitted under Rule 25B2 to take youth and its attendant factors into consideration in deciding whether a verdict can be reduced from murder in, murder in the second degree to, uh, to manslaughter and a term of years imposed. That would leave the judge the opportunity to impose a 15 to life, but the 15 to life would be judicially imposed. But that's a very different. That, I mean, because that's really making a determination that the crime of manslaughter as opposed to the crime of murder is what happened here. Well, I'd like the court to look at Commonwealth versus Sakfan Chim, C-H-H-I-M, where we can perhaps resolve an old dispute between Justice Spina and Justice Gantz. In Chim, this court uh, reviewed the trial court's uh, discretion, opportunity, obligation to decide under Rule 25B2 that a verdict was not consonant with justice. And while generally we look to the weight of the evidence, and while there are some conflict between Chim and Rowan, R-O-L-O-N, as to what the proper role of 25B2 is, consonant with justice is the language of the rule. And we can read a rule that way. But if we don't, say I'm wrong. Say you can't. You can't leave it as it is. Because as it is, what you have, first of all, you're giving less to the juvenile seconds than, you, than the juvenile firsts have. Well, and then the difference there, in your view, is that you don't have 33E review? Right, because okay. 33E review is a judicial review of but, a sentence. But it doesn't, it seems to me that if I understand your argument, whether it's first degree or second degree, the same problem of the judge imposing a sentence of life it's is not, there. It's not that a judge can't impose a sentence of life. Under the argument, no, but, it, but I it's it's here. right. But I mean, at the moment, it's a it's a it's a mandatory sentence a of life. A judge right. can impose a discretionary sentence of fifteen to life. A judge cannot be commanded to impose on a child a sentence of fifteen to life. That is, a judge could, in his discretion, but he cannot be required to. And the reason that he can't be required to impose a 15 to life is because then there will be ju no judicial input whatsoever on whether the child serves life. And Graham, <clears throat> as well as Miller, as well as Di recognized in Dychenko, all say that you can't have a child condemned to life Mandatory. There has to be a judicial hearing where a judge is allowed to say this particular child, a child like this one, a child <clears throat> who has been beaten since the age of one, a child with a limited IQ, a child who is not the worst of the worst. Counsel, what about um, Diachinko, which appears to mean that all the juvenile is entitled to is a meaningful opportunity for um, release. And th that is prohibited, of course, if you have uh, the mandatory life indefinitely without parole, which we don't have anymore. But um, as, as I understand it, uh, Diachinko just says that that's all that the juvenile is entitled to. Are you suggesting that uh, 
that doesn't go far enough and that we should do something else with that? I am suggesting that Dychenko, this, this court quite correctly solved in Dychenko the problem that was presented to this court in Dychenko, which is murder one, which has 233E relief. So whether or not the court will need to adjust the nature and the presumptions of 233E relief for the first degree children is a question, as you would correctly say, is put to another day. But what we do say is the juvenile seconds, they don't even have 233E relief. There is no judicial opportunity at all except through 25B2 for a judge to consider whether or not a particular child should end up serving life subject only to the parole board's discretionary review. And that is because it's not that parole might not be a meaningful opportunity for release, it's because parole is not an exercise of judicial authority sheltered from political sentiment and a parole hearing is not contemporaneous and a parole hearing has no right to counsel and a, the obligation of parole is institutionally not opposed but different and altered from what a judge does. Parole is, as Justice Cordy was saying, about other matters concerned with public safety, and parole as a matter of statute is precluded from releasing someone under circumstances where a judge is basically precluded from releasing someone, and I quote this in my brief, if they think they will commit a violation of law, which is shoplifting, that's not, you can't get under Miller, under Dychenko, under Graham, you've now set up, a, inadvertently, the legislature didn't intend this statutory framework. This is a statutory framework which is created by our evolving standards of decency. So, so I, I'm sorry, and maybe you've just said this, but putting aside your 25 v 2 okay. point, what would the, what are you proposing as the solution to the problem? If Dyachenko didn't go far enough or was, didn't have exactly the problem, and, and let's, what do you say should happen? You could. Apart from 25B2. You could add a meaningful 233E review for juveniles con convicted of second. That would be stretching the statute, but you could. Okay. Or you could invalidate the sentence of 15 to life and say, and leave it open as, as my, uh, the friend of the court suggests in, from Yad or, and say there is no mandatory sentencing or no mandatory sentence which ends in life. You can't leave it as it is. So, but I, would you have any role in your vision? Is there any role for uh, the parole board to, I, I'm just trying to, I'm trying to figure Judge, out. I'm not saying a judge couldn't give a kid 15 to life. A judge could. It's perfectly okay. permissible for a child so far, and I don't argue otherwise, to have a sentence that is 15 to life. I'm not and then, and then, the, and then it's going to be entirely up to the parole board whether at 15 or 20 or whenever. The judge might well say that. Judge Troy could have looked at all this and had a hearing and said, I think 15 to life is appropriate. And... Mr. Okoro would not have complained, but that's not what we got. Judge, yeah, I, yeah, I, Judge I Troy got skipped, and what I'm saying is you can't skip Judge Troy. You can't say no 233E only straight from the legislature to parole, which is the cops. But, but now you've confused me, because when you say there's a need for a Miller hearing, and therefore there should be no mandatory sentence, uh, this court in our review under 33E does not do a Miller hearing. We don't take evidence. We don't hear from witnesses. A sentencing judge would do that. But H how does the 33E review relate to your view that there has to be a Miller hearing and that the judge, the sentencing judge must have discretion? Well, 
here's how 233E most respectfully, if, that, if the court were to say, and I'm not here on murder one, that 233E suffices because there is judicial review, then what you would have would be a sentencing hearing in a trial court. You would have, after a juvenile was convicted, and what really should be happening in all these cases is a sentencing review because you do have the power under 233E to review a sentence in the interest of justice. And for, but and you we do. don't, but, but, well, it's usually whether we're going to have it be first or second. We don't say, well, it shouldn't be, year, you know, some, some version of years. You do. You have authority to reduce to manslaughter. You have. And if you look at, say, Aaron Colloran, where this court looked at a woman with postpartum depression and moved it from one to two based on factors having nothing to do with the sufficiency of the evidence. You've reduced, if you look actually at um, Judge Graney's fine book summarizing in homicide practice, that list of cases, which is also listed in Commonwealth versus Golden. But that's it, changing the crime. That's changing the crime. That's different from a sentencing hearing, isn't it? But you change, when you go from murder one to murder two, you're not doing it sometimes because of the, the evidence that the crime was committed. You're doing it because of the nature of the person and the circumstance of the person who's committed the crime. I may come to you and argue otherwise. I am hoping to give you a solution from a statutory framework which really doesn't make sense. But I, you know, on the days that I'm not here, you know, I go to the Lynn District Court and I argue about unnatural acts between consenting adults and parked cars. This is actually relevant. It has to do with what the court did there was they interpolated a requirement of public place into the unnatural acts statute, which is nowhere in the statute. And the court said, let us save the statute and make it constitutional by adding the element of public place, which the legislature didn't think to ever add and since, since forever. And so you can. OK. In the end, I, I, thank I, I, you. I think we've given you, thank you abundant time. Thank the absence you. of any further questions. Thank uh, you, Judge. Well, thank you. And we'll turn to thank you, court. Mr. Libby. Good morning, may it please the court. Matthew Libby on behalf of the Commonwealth. I'm an assistant DA from the Plymouth District. I'd like to first address the defendant's claim that his mandatory life sentence of, um, his life sentence uh, with parole eligibility after 15 years is unconstitutional. I'd uh, respectfully suggest this court has, um, uh, needs to look no further than its own opinions in Brown and, and Diachenko from last, last winter um, to reach its conclusion that they are constitutional. Yes, but the argument is that those didn't go far enough or they're not actually correct. Respectfully, Your Honor, I would suggest that the court um, implicitly endorsed um, a life sentence uh, with the possibility of parole um, by allowing those uh, Diachenko and Brown to be I, sentenced. I know we did. I'm just, but the question is, was that the correct answer? Respectfully, it is, Your Honor. Um, because? The legislature is free to pres prescribe lengthy sentences um, to juveniles who commit uh, extremely uh, violent crimes, such as murder. Um, and that's um, uh, supported by the, this, this court's case law. Um, it's, it's for the legislature to de determine and balance the interests of the safety of the public uh, with the rights um, uh, of juveniles. And respectfully, uh, I would suggest that um, Miller and, and this court in Diachenko and Brown uh, went no further than to say that the difference in um, a life sentence without possibility of parole and a life sentence is that there's a finality, that in either a, a death sentence case or a uh, life without parole case, the, the, the result is the same. The juvenile is going to die in prison. However, as this court recognizes, um, with juveniles, uh, that's, that's unconstitutional because a child needs to have the opportunity to rehabilitate himself and have some meaningful opportunity to release. But the, but the argument that I understand that she's making is that a sentence of life with the possibility of parole is from the, from, from the point of view of the judge, a sentence to life. Uh, and then it's up to the executive branch to determine whether that sentence is served in prison or is served on parole. Uh, but ultimately, but from the point of view of the judge, you, when a judge sentences somebody to life, that is a life sentence. And then it's now up to a different branch of government to determine whether or not the person is released. And as I understand the argument, the argument says 
it is essentially cruel and unusual for a court to have a mandatory life sentence and then leave it to another branch of government to determine whether or not the person is rehabilitated and therefore should be released, that we are essentially still imposing a mandatory sentence. It's almost asking the court not to go any further than it did in Diachenko and Brown. I suggest that the, although it is still a life sentence, um, the juvenile still has a meaningful opportunity for release by um, appropriately behaving in, in prison, rehabilitating himself, and presenting himself to the board. I suggest that there's no reason to, for that sentencing judge to believe um, that, that that juvenile, um, if he's appropriately uh, rehabilitated, to, to, to never uh, have an opportunity to be released. However, as this court uh, um, notes in Diachenko and Brown, um, that does not mean that every juvenile who's convicted of murder and sentenced to life um, will be released. It's, it's incumbent upon the juvenile, while he's in prison, to re rehabilitate himself and to prove himself before that parole board. Can, uh, can, I, can I ask you this question? And, and I know this is not relevant, but I'm trying to understand what the current state of the law is. The most recent amendments with respect to second-degree murder statutes with regard to juveniles, what do they require going forward? What do they provide? With respect to the, this, the discretionary um, right. parole, uh, so uh, going forward, uh, and I don't believe uh, Mr. Okoro um, is subject to these uh, right. new amendments, um, but going forward, uh, the sentencing judge would have the opportunity to uh, set the parole eligibility dates um, for a, uh, a second degree murder case. Um, the, the judge can set that minimum uh, eligibility date, I believe, uh, between 15 and, and 25 years um, uh, at a sentencing hearing. Um, and I think the court obviously left it to the legislature to address um, the issue with juveniles who were convicted of first-degree murder. And in my brief, I, I noted that um, perhaps the legislature will adopt a, a similar uh, parole eligibility uh, sentence. Um, uh, but with respect, so with respect to a juvenile now convicted of second-degree murder, the judge would have to sentence to life, but can set a period where parole or a time when parole would be available? That's correct. And for ju for those convicted as under 17, under 18, is it 15 years or could it be 25? For, for be juveniles, 25. it could be up to 25. It could. Uh, and, and I misread your brief. Okay. Okay. I apologize. And, and what I would suggest, Your Honor, is that um, as long as, as the court notes in, in, in Diachenko and Brown, as long as um, it doesn't, the legislature doesn't pass a law that effectively makes um, the parole eligibility date uh, akin to life without the possibility of parole, such as 80 years, 100 years, something to that effect, um, but that, that would still pass constitutional muster. What, so I would suggest that with respect to a first degree uh, um, uh, sentence um, for a juvenile, uh, the legislature will be free to uh, present a, um, another sentencing uh, range um, that you know, could, could perhaps be, be more, could be the same, um, whatever the legislature's prerogative is. So if this gentleman were sentenced today for a crime committed after 2012, the judge could say life, parole eligibility at, 50, at 25 years? Correct. Okay. Um. Do you have a sense of how many juveniles are in this particular basket of cases uh, sentenced for second degree, but uh, sentenced before the new law came into effect? I don't know the number off the top of my head. I, I did look at the parole uh, website, um, and they did publish a, um, a sheet. Uh, it's a one-page sheet that, that lists um, all of the, the juveniles, um, and I think they break it down by first degree and second degree, um, and they also further break it down by um, initial hearings versus um, uh, review hearings. Um, but I would suggest that it's going to be a very relatively small uh, class of individuals um, who are um, find themselves in a situation where they um, were convicted of a second degree um, and, and theoretically would face that uh, that, that possible um, uh, situation where they have a, a different sentence or perhaps a more severe sentence than someone convicted of a first degree murder. Um, with respect to the uh, defendant's argument uh, regarding youth as a mitigation factor, uh, the Commonwealth would suggest um, that that's not um, uh, uh, an appropriate uh, argument that can be made to a jury. And I, would, I would point the court to the, uh, the holding in uh, <coughs> Ogden O, uh, which states that, that um, it's improper to allow evidence for a jury to consider evidence that children between the ages of uh, 7 and 14 are incapable of uh, uh, committing criminal acts between um, 
criminal acts because of their insufficient brain development. And I would suggest that that's um, something that should be uh, uh, continued uh, in the case law. Um, again, it's, it's for the legislature to prescribe <clears throat> the crimes um, uh, and whether or not juveniles should be subject to them. And of course, uh, in 1906, the, the, court, uh, the legislature creates the uh, juvenile court and acknowledges that children are different and need to be treated different. However, the crimes <clears throat> um, are, are the same. Where Whether, was this tried? This trial was in 2010. Where, what court? It was the Brockton Superior Court. Right, so it wasn't a, a, <clears throat> in the juvenile court. That's correct, Your Honor. So that's where those factors come into play, don't they? Your Honor, I, I would suggest that... At the point, they're not coming into play at all with respect to this individual, they're, because he wasn't uh, adjudicated in, in the juvenile court, because that's been read out of the statute. And Correct, Your Honor, but as this court has noted, there's no constitutional uh, right to be uh, prosecuted in the juvenile court. I don't mean read out of the statute. That's been changed so that he's not permitted to be tried in the, that court. Correct. A, a, a person decision um, where he goes. who commits murder um, will be prosecuted in the superior court. They're not going to be prosecuted in the juvenile court. Um, but I would suggest that... Uh, so where does the, the, all of the stuff that normally gets considered, as it was in Ogdeno, get considered here in these circumstances? Well, Your Honor, in this particular defendant's case, um, the, the, the jury um, was able, as, as Your Honor pointed out, able to consider a number of uh, factors regarding this particular defendant, um, but not... Um, juveniles uh, as a whole class. And I would suggest... Um, why isn't that relevant? It was a defense, so why wasn't it relevant to the defense that in addition to these uh, historical <coughs> and sociological and personal factors to this individual, emotional and otherwise, there are also factors relevant because of his age that various courts have described as, as defining characteristics or central characteristics or whatever, many you don't need to use the word impairment, but they are unique to this age group. Well, first, I would suggest that a lot of the case law deals with sentencing as opposed to culpability. Mm -hmm. um, second, I would, I would respectfully suggest that it's up to the legislature to determine uh, whether or not children uh, should be charged uh, with these particular crimes and what, what protection should be afforded them under the, uh, the juvenile court jurisdiction. But, but this is a different question. I, I think this is a different question, and maybe it's the question I have as well, which is... Um, First of all, do you agree that the testimony that was given in this trial was permissible? Was I would say extensive. I, um, most of it was permissible. Uh, I would take issue with um, the discussion regarding um, the myelination, uh, the, the, uh, the, con the, the, the frontal lobe, because that goes, uh, I would suggest, too far and, and suggests and, and allows the jury to consider can a, uh, a juvenile, um, based on this expert's opinion, can a juvenile form the intent uh, to commit murder? Uh, can, can this juvenile... Uh, so the expert couldn't say, this is, uh, this is a 14-year-old, and these are the various characteristics that I observe based on his history, and maybe we've even done an MRI, and the frontal lobe is developed as a typical 14-year-old, you know, which means it has less impulse control, whatever the, the terminology is. That's not permissible? I would suggest that there's specific... Um, MRI done for that particular defendant. But then you would relate it to the typicality of and what, what that means. What I would offer, Your Honor, is that as the U.S. Supreme Court noted in Roper, um, the, uh, the, the ruling basically, uh, or the, the science is basically um, confirming what we've already, we've always known. We've known in 1906 that juveniles are different. Um, every parent, teacher, coach, they all know that children are different. They have a different decision-making process than adults do. Here we have a jury who, who they've all experienced being 15 years old. But, but, but we're not really talking about uh, an automatic rule. Um, is this really any different than uh, an insanity defense that's based on an organic brain disorder? When we recognize that a psychiatrist can get up and say that, that the defendant has an organic brain disorder, and, and, and based on this order, it's my opinion, that the person can't form the, uh, the, the, the uh, doesn't appreciate the wrongfulness of his conduct or, or cannot conform his conduct to the requirements of the law. We already permit that for organic brain disorders. Isn't youth doesn't youth fall into that same category such that a psychiatrist or a psychologist could get up and say, 
based on the, the, you know, what I've observed about this person, some tests that I've administered to him, the personality test, the IQ test, all these kinds of things. I may or may not have done an MRI. It's my opinion that this person uh, either cannot form, uh, conform his conduct to the requirements of the law or, um, you know, the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the diminished capacity uh, category. It's my opinion that the person can't uh, form the intent to premeditate. Or, or the, the, why can't we do it the same way we do organic brain disorders? Why can't it be treated the same way? Respectfully, Your Honor, in, in those cases, it's always um, a, a focus on that individual defendant. Well, that's what I'm saying. It, it, this is an automatic for, for all juveniles. It's specific to a, to a defendant based upon psychiatric or psychological testimony. And respectfully, Your Honor, I think that it should always be um, focused on one particular defendant. The jury, in this case, as in all other cases, is always going to be instructed that they need to find that this particular defendant um, had, had a state of mind. The Commonwealth had been able to prove beyond a reasonable doubt what that state of mind was. Um, with respect to this case, the, uh, with the third prong malice instruction, the, the jury was instructed they had to find um, that the Commonwealth proved uh, you know, intent um, or, uh, and uh, knowing that, that stabbing this man a number of times is going to create a plain and strong likelihood of death. The, the burden is always on the Commonwealth to prove that as it relates to one particular defendant. Um, I would just. Did, did the judge instruct that they could consider the expert's testimony in deciding whether or not the Commonwealth had met that burden? There was um, not as part of that particular instruction, but as part of the, the full instructions, um, the court did instruct that the, 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 the jury could consider the expert. He gave a standard expert uh, uh, instruction. If the, uh, let's assume we didn't have a child, but had an adult, 21 years old. Uh, an expert testifies that for whatever reason, the frontal lobe really did not develop. The person has problems with impulse control. Uh, and this particular person has the frontal lobe of a 14-year-old uh, and therefore has a mental impairment which should be considered in deciding whether or not he had the intent uh, or, or whether or not uh, there was extreme atrocity or cruelty. Would that be fine? I think it would be appropriate for that expert to testify about that particular defendant because the, the jurors um, who, who are, are people who are parents, coaches, teachers, who understand what it's like to be a 14-year-old would be allowed to consider that. And I would suggest uh, that in this particular case, there's no reason to believe that the jury didn't understand that they were looking at a 15-year-old. The fact that Mr. Okora was 15 years old uh, was in the record um, at the time. But, but uh, isn't, isn't implicit in Chief Justice Gaines's question uh, the premise that a 14-year-old can't doesn't have the ability to have a 14-year-old, doesn't have the ability to uh, intend to deliberately premeditate or to, to have the requisite intent for extreme atrocity or cruelty? Respectfully, Your Honor, I, I would again say that that's a question for the legislature to determine if these are a class of people who should be subject to this particular crime. Um, but as a defense, it, it should not be permitted as a, as a so-called mitigating factor. And I would just uh, um, very briefly note that um, the, the court. Yeah, I will give you. I will give you extra time because I gave her. So okay, I'll be very, very brief if I if I could. Um, there could be a situation where two uh, identical juveniles are, are placed on trial for first degree murder, um, and they're both allowed to bring in an, an expert um, who is going to say that uh, because he's, this juvenile is uh, 14 years old, he cannot um, form the intent to, to commit murder. Um, in one particular case, uh, perhaps the jury likes that, def that defense expert and des um, decides to uh, convict the, the juvenile of manslaughter. In the second case, perhaps that juvenile doesn't like that uh, expert. Perhaps that, that, that jury um, thought the prosecutor did an excellent cross-examination and discounts that, that expert's testimony. You could then have that uh, juvenile convicted of first-degree murder. And when it's left to uh, evidence, uh, put forth by the juvenile as opposed to the legislature who can determine whether or not this is a class of people who should be subject to prosecution for this crime, you can respectfully uh, have an absurd, an absurd result. That with, happens in, in any case. I mean, not every case is the defendant found guilty or not guilty. I mean, it just depends on the circumstances. So how is that a problem? Because, Your Honor, it's... Uh, it's it, it, my, my point is that it should be left for the legislature, it, not for... Um, to decide who's guilty and who's not guilty? I, I that, think the that point... That doesn't make any sense, does it? I, I think the point you're making, and maybe I misunderstand as well, is that if the legislature says that 14 and 15 and 16-year-olds can be prosecuted for first-degree murder, that is inconsistent with... Um, 
evidence that 14, 15, and 16 year olds can't commit murder because they're too young, right? Is that your, you, in other words, if, if the legislature says this group can be prosecuted for first degree murder, then the rule can't be that because they have a 14 or 15 or 16 year old brain, they can't form the intent to commit murder. That would be, is, is that your argument here? Yes, it is. That, that essentially, um, that, that shouldn't be allowed to be put forth out of the as, as, a, as a per se rule as opposed to an individually applied characteristic analysis of this person. Correct. The, the, the focus uh, should always be on that particular defendant, whether it's, you know, he has oppositional defiant disorder or low IQ or whatever. All the things that Okoro had. Just ask one more question. I know we're running out of time here, but I'm focusing now on this particular issue. It, and, and the question posed by my colleague, Justice Hines, in every case, and what, what I, I understand the def, uh, defendant's really saying, it's, it's an expert, you can discount it, just let me find the defense. It's certainly the case that in some cases, given the particular circumstances of the crime, how it occurred, what he did, when he did it, you know, what was he thinking and saying and doing, yes, it's going to be murder one, it's going to be murder two, it's going to be whatever it is. In others, it won't be, just as in every other case where characteristics or disabilities or peculiar circumstances that relate to human beings who have a condition come into play or don't, and we leave it to a jury. Why isn't that okay? Succinctly, the, my, my point is that an expert should not be allowed to come in and tell a jury that all 15-year-olds or all 14-year-olds can't commit this particular crime and that, this, and, and that a particular defendant should be acquitted because as a class, they cannot. They lack the, the the brain development to commit a particular crime. So that how would about a here? particular juvenile? That's that's. You seem to be going both ways on this. How about if it's just about a particular juvenile? Can they do that? If it's about a particular juvenile, it needs to be about that particular juvenile's development history yeah, background. Yeah. Can, is that okay? The, the, the factors I just listed, yes. And I think that that was most of what Dr. Kinsher uh, testified to in this particular case. But when it's, um, when it's simply talking about, and what the, the trial judge precluded um, the, Dr. Kinsher from testifying about uh, was you can't say that all 15-year-olds cannot commit murder. Uh, that, that should not be uh, uh, admissible. Uh, in, but but if, if because if, he was 15, he couldn't form the intent to commit murder. In exactly, that's but not if, an argument you can make. But if the expert says he has the brain that is typical of a 15-year-old, and here is what it means to have a typical 15-year-old brain, is that okay or is that not okay by your standard? The distinction is that he's not saying all 15-year-olds can't commit murder. But what he is doing is allowing the jury. Um, to, to evaluate a 21-year-old or 25-year-old as someone who uh, has the brain of a 15-year-old because all jurors know w <coughs> what that means, basically, what it means to be a 15-year-old versus a 25-year-old. No, but, but he can't bring the science to bear when he says that this person has a 15-year-old brain, he's 15, and what that means for this person is his, his frontal lobe hasn't developed, his, uh, you know, the pruning hasn't taken place. For him, this means... Yeah. He has an underdeveloped uh, sense of, you know, whatever the things are that, uh, that, that he could testify to that he couldn't hear. Again, I would respectfully go back to, to, to the U.S. Supreme Court. Is that point. okay, that part? If, it's, if it just focuses, bringing in the science, but then talking about one person, the person on trial? I, I think the focus always has to be on the, 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 the individual on trial. Um, the, so the, answering the, my question, could he bring the science of, of, of a youth's brain to bear bring it all in and say, this is it, this is what happens, this is what, and with respect to this one, my opinion would be. Respectfully, no, Your Honor. I would suggest that, as the, the court said in, in Roper, uh, the science is basically confirming what we've already known, and, and what the jury that's made up of, of parents, teachers, people who have been 15 years old, what they already know as well, which is that it's, it's, it's you know, it can be tough being a 15-year-old, and, and they always apply that um, when they get instructed uh, as to what the Commonwealth needs to prove uh, with respect to intent. All right. If there are no further questions, we'll take our morning recess. Thank you. Thank you. All right.